We're live now. That red light is on, so that means we're recording. Okay, I just wanted to share a little bit of my story, and because we've got some newcomers here today, a little bit of my story around food addiction. And like most people know with my story, I, um, my primary addiction was food addiction. I was also a workaholic, had other addictions. But um, so I got the kidney failure and I, you know, I surrendered in the hospital bed. I had a spiritual, heavenly time with spiritual experience. It was uh, my first ma major spiritual, I hadn't had spiritual experiences up until that point, no spirituality. And um, I also heard a message, find a spiritual solution. And that led to, uh, but it didn't say where, that was a problem. So that led to going to all kinds <laughs> of, didn't say where, you know, just said find a spiritual solution, just a little message, that's yeah. it. And then okay. say like go go to like you know like to Oxford Street or Bond Street or <laughs> and find go give me, to give me directions yeah. just to find a spiritual solution. Anyway, so I just ended up after they released me from hospital, trying to go to every spiritual group in London that I could think of. I just went up. I went to the Body Mind Spirit Festival. I went to the thing. I trained in Reiki, spiritual healing. Became a hypnotherapist. Um, did all kinds of things, everyone, you know, uh, and I won't go into it. I had, I joined some wonderful places and I joined some horrible cults as well. Mm. Uh, and maybe not today's the time for a food story, but there were some not so nice experiences as well. Mm. And, um, but suddenly in one of the groups I had a mentor and this guy, this mentor, I think you can say, I won't mention his name. This mentor, he'd spent his whole life going around the world to gurus. Mm. You know, anyone who's supposed to be a guru or an enlightened teacher, he would just jet off everywhere and spend his whole life. And he was my mentor in this spiritual group. You know, he was assigned to be my mentor. And, uh, you know, I told him a bit about myself and it was a spirit, spirit not, not a 12 step thing. And he suddenly said to me, he just said one day, he just looked at me and said, Sabia, watch this DVD. He said, watch this DVD. And he gave me this DVD and I put this DVD on. And it was a guy called Dr. David R. Hawkins. Mm. And as soon as the thing came on, I had a spiritual experience. My mm. second. I first the hospital and then suddenly like a tingling up my spine. It was like I was in bliss. I was engulfed in bliss and in this resonance. As this man, old man started to speak. And I had, oh, it's a sign from God. First I have a, a, like a near-death type of spiritual experience and a message, find a spiritual solution. And then... Sometime later, a guy gives me, who's been around the world meeting gurus and teachers, gives me this DVD and I have my second. And I knew that that was like God. Mm -hmm. God said, like, he gave me the first bit, find this bit, and then God was saying, you found it. This is the guy. Mm -hmm. This was the guy. And he, he's, he's my main teacher. I've got another teacher. Anyway, he, he, he told me about Dr. Hawking. He later told me to go to a guy in Brixton mm -hmm. uh, called Muji. And, uh, and I did go. I resisted because of the name. Yeah. I thought, no, I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna visit someone called Muji. And so everyone else was going in the car to see Muji and then uh, and they would come back and say it was amazing, you know, they blissed out and then eventually one of the guys persuaded me and I went to see this other guy called Muji. But anyway, I digress. And this guy I later found out, he was uh, Dr. David R. Hawkins, he was um, uh, Bill Wilson's sponsee, anyone who's in 12-step groups or goes to Alcoholics Anonymous or any of the sister fellowships uh, that are related with food or work or whatever, he was uh, one of the sponsees of the founders of the 12 steps and uh, that's how he started his journey uh, and let go of his primary addiction but then he evolved further and he was led to the, the Course in Miracles and uh, he was also led to a guy called Dr. David uh, Goodhart. He was a chiropractor who was using muscles to test whether, you know, like if you hold some vitamins and you hold it, your arms stay strong. You put some rat poison, your arms go weak. But then he later intuited that, you know, you can find out anything, whether it's true or false. Because you're aligned, when you're aligned with the universe, the love of the universe, if you make a statement or listen to music or make a choice, that's in alignment with the love of the universe, your hand goes strong. So it's like mm -hmm. a, you can like speak to God. Mm -hmm. if, you can do the, if you can do this properly and you're aligned spiritually, your motives are right, mm -hmm. you, can get, you can get answers, you know, like, is it good to listen to Beethoven or shall I listen to gangster rap music? And your arm will tell you what God thinks about it, you see. Mm -hmm. 
in your weakness. And, you can, and it's also intuitive that you can make statements from any time. So all the information in the universe is like here. It's like God is omniscient everywhere throughout all time, before time, prior to time, everywhere, all information. So you can like, oh, what about uh, Freud? And what about Carl Jung? And what about what happened in history? And did this person make a spiritual choice? This historical figure. So you can find it all out, you know. Mm. As long as your motives are spiritual, you don't want to ask ego questions because you might be eligible for that. Anyway, so I knew then, at that time, I, I had a, a horrible food disorder. You know, to the, you know, I was sharing with a lot of people today, to the extent when doctors saying, avoid high potassium, you've got kidney failures, binging on bananas, mm. and having emergency treatments for a heart attack. So that kind of insanity around food. But I knew, mm. you know, and what he said was really interesting. I'll talk a bit about food addiction very quickly. Mm. Because that was my primary, that's my first addiction, my primary this thing of numbing out from the world. How do I repress my feelings? How do I repress my feelings? And how do I have this... And of course, in Miracles talks about it, the illusion of fear and separation. The illusion, because I was, because I was never feeling my feelings and binging on food and then later binging on work and then later binging on relationships and codependency and love addiction and then all of these things. I've been, and so I never got to feel my stuff and my ego has always knew something I could try and control or get in the world to that either to make me special or to get something special mm -hmm. that's the magic word they use in the Course of Miracles specialness mm -hmm. either I have to be special or if I'm not special if I know this guy over here then I'm going to be special if I can be friends with that special guy over there so it's all these things or if I can eat food or not eat food but primary was food and what I real and also uh, just very very quickly, uh, uh, no, I won't talk about that right now. So, and he shared that you know we've got like all these repressed feelings like shame, guilt, anger, whatever. If you stop, if you stop fixing or using on the food, on TV, on Netflix, on Facebook, on relationships, on career, success, money. And then all these, and you stop trying to like medicate yourself on all the things, the shiny things in the world which are special. Then you know your feelings, all this repressed energy is going to come up. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and actually, we'll be doing it this on my YouTube channel. He put feel the feelings, all my f videos on feel the feelings. I've got another one on on the observer tool, but feel the feelings. Like if you just sit and just allow everything to come up and let go of your thinking then you can release all of this stuff that's creating addiction. The urge to eventually, if you've got so much repressed feelings, you become an addict. Like you can't stop doing the thing to get relief until it will kill you. Yeah. Quite literally, once you're in that severe yeah. field, you know, you're like, an alcoholic will not stop drinking until they're dead. Mm -hmm. Like I will not, you know, my thing was like, you know, doctors were saying, don't eat that food, you'll, you'll get a heart attack. I was eating that food to get a heart attack. Mm. So that's like, an energy field. I'm in resonance with a vibration in the universe which is death. Mm -hmm. Like I don't deserve even to live. Mm -hmm. I deserve to do unconsciously, eat food, choose relationships. You know, I was eating food to kill myself. I chose a relation, a career in the stock market which was basically suicide. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, like, you know, like it was very intense, full of drama, full of uh, choices which weren't spiritual. And uh, that was leading to death because that would increase the guilt. Also, I won't go into it in this, you know, choosing relationships which were like insane. Mm -hmm. You know, you could you know, say that you could, you know. So everything was to choose death, basically. So, but if I just feel out like my repressed feelings, I do. Um, the thing with food uh, that I wanted to do, which I intuited, was that, and I learned this from the Course in Miracles. What I learned, uh, you can cancel your belief in anything. So it is possible if you do the Course in Miracles. If you want to eat donuts, you can eat donuts. You can cancel your belief in it. But uh, we'll go into that later. That might be confusing. But um, uh, but anyway, uh, when you cancel your belief in something, it takes work. So you know, sometimes there's an easier way than to cancel your belief in all of this stuff. But anyway, I thought, you know, like one of the first lessons in the Course in Miracles is to make everything meaningless. And this is really, really critical to how the ego functions. 
because the ego can only you can only track what has meaning you can only see what has meaning you can only experience what has meaning if something is meaningless it disappears mm. okay so like uh, like I used to binge on donuts so if there was a donut on the table I would only remember the whole hour or two hours I, I would just remember a donut what happened in that two hour meeting there was a donut on the table that would be it for me because my ego it's meaningful it's so meaningful the donut and that sugar that that's the only thing that would have meaning like someone else would say there was a nice flowers mm -hmm. but for me it was just a, it would be just so whatever my ego creates meaning from mm -hmm. or is special or has this higher power status then I track it I experience it I see it mm. anything that's meaningless I don't see I don't experience it has no there's no thing so like I would not remember that you know I wouldn't remember that there's a English dictionary behind me because that would be not important mm -hmm. you know, I would not even see it or notice it but donut I would you know uh, so and then the Course in Miracles, one of the first lessons in the Course in Miracles is look at everything for the same amount of time and say it's meaningless. Mm -hmm. And this is something interesting. The same, like if I look at an object, I should look at it for like an equal amount of time, like one second. Like the camera is, is meaningless for one second. And then I look at this guy. This guy is meaningless. I look at him for one second. And then I look at the light bulb. The light bulb is meaningless for one second. It's an equal amount of time. Mm -hmm. and everything is equally meaningless. There is nothing in this room which is special. Mm -hmm. And then as I start to do that, I'm taking out the specialness mm -hmm. out of anything. But if I... Um, mm. so, and then, and then these things start to disappear. And I, you know, I'm in 12-step fellowship with food. And I say in there that uh, I've had only one day of food obsession in eight years, but I'm essentially for years and years in a position of neutrality around food, like donuts, cakes, chocolates, they have no meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, because I've been doing this thing, I, have, I, done, I do a few things, because this is for anyone who's suffering with food addiction. What I do, but take what you want, leave the rest, you don't have to do what I do. So I realized if things are... So I decided to eat foods which are uh, symbolic of meaninglessness to me. And that's what I do at the moment. That's just the thing. See, so I eat things like I, I don't get excited by boiled broccoli. <laughs> I'm not excited by boiled broccoli. Mm -hmm. I know this will trigger some food addicts, but you know, it's just me. Take what you need. The rest. You know, I don't get triggered by boiled broccoli. I don't get triggered by like boiled chicken. Mm. You know, like uh, chocolate cake, donuts, eclairs. You know, so I started eating foods which are already giving me a head start. You know, healthy meals, mm. healthy meals with carbs, uh, protein, because I'm in a 12 step fellowship, sure I can't do anything too exerted. But, you know, like a healthy meal with carbs, veg, and protein, mm -hmm. but as close as possible to it not, you know, not having lots of spicy sauces and lots of, you know, exciting things mm. to, to do it. So they're particularly uh, meaningless. You don't have to do this. I mean, you know, everyone can do what, whatever they want to do. So, because, but I wanted complete freedom, and I wanted it such that, you know, my head can't, can't think about it. You know, it can't block me off from the present moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so that was one thing. The other thing to do is, like, because food is my primary drug, it's my primary drug, and I realized that that's the way I have all this huge reservoir of feelings I don't want to feel. Mm -hmm. So I have to eat ravenously until, so I, I keep the lid shut on all these volcanic feelings coming up, you know. And I was a food addict, extreme food addict. So when I decided to do this, and I was in a 12-step program, um, what I was hit with was, um, so I decided to become abstinent with the help of a sponsor in a 12-step program and doing The Course in Miracles and everything else. And, um, and I woke up at 4 a.m. in the morning and I couldn't breathe. And I felt like I was suffocating, I was dying, you know, and I couldn't breathe. And mm. this thought came in my head like, binge, binge on food. It was like 4 a.m., I was feeling foggy. And I just mm. walked down into the kitchen and I, bit, and I binged on the food, all the food in the kitchen. And it was funny, you know, I think it's hilarious food addiction because the panic attack stopped. 
-hmm. And it's uh, funny because I can't breathe mm -hmm. and I'm suffocating, I'm dying. And yet I went into the kitchen and I ate the food. And it's like a lack of oxygen, eat food. But I ate the food and I could breathe again. So I'm thinking, wow. what? I didn't go for like call the ambulance or I can't <laughs> die or I need an oxygen mask. Yeah. I didn't food. So I didn't even understand why, like you're dying and you can't breathe. I went to the kitchen, but it did. And apparently I didn't need oxygen. I needed like food and that stopped it. So the ego is very clever. The ego is very clever and it stopped it. But I was mortified. I was really mortified because I'd like committed no more binging. And, but it got me in the middle of the night with, and I was half, not properly and then I just went for the, and then I said to myself and Dr. Hawkins is my teacher I said and, and we talk about this so we're going to get to the scary bit for the new people um, so I knew that for me to get to where I want to be I have to face the death of my ego mm. you know at a certain point if you do advance in my, uh, I had this near death spiritual and I knew God was asking me to face this thing of where does life come from? Does life come from doing what my ego wants? Or does life come from putting my ego on the block mm -hmm. to God and to face ego death? So, you know, I always quote, um, I think it's time to quote St. Francis. Mm -hmm. St. Francis says, it's in dying mm -hmm. that one is born mm -hmm. to eternal life. And the fa my famous quote from St. Francis is what you're looking for is where you're looking from, yeah? What you're looking for mm -hmm. is where you're looking from. So when you're in your ego, you're looking outside for something, yes. yeah? But actually, your ego looks out into the world to find a solution. But actually, prior to your ego, mm -hmm. before your ego, there is a place, I call it the observer. Yes. Prior to the ego, that's what you're really looking for. Everyone's got an ego looking out there mm. to find what is the solution. But actually, before your thoughts is the witnesser. And that's what Saint, I believe St. Francis was indicating, that you want to go before your ego to find eternal life, to find the love of God. So, so I knew that, yes, I, I, if I want to get well, for me, I'll have to face uh, my ego death. My ego death. So I thought, okay. So it's going to be like, it's like facing death, you know, panic attack is like facing death and it's going to be like, and I was willing, and I just want to share this for everyone, I was willing, the next time I had a panic attack in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. I said, I, I'd be, I'm willing to die of the panic attack, but I will not eat the food. Yeah. I'm willing to die. And I really was, you know, it was like, okay. Mm -hmm. And that somehow that grace was there, it was like, I was going to get out of bed the next time a panic attack, because I knew it would hit me. It chose the most vulnerable time, middle mm -hmm. of the night, the panic attack. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't choose the middle of the day in a, you know, in a, in a, with, with spiritual friends. So the next time it was, I had a DVD, my D Dr. Hawkins DVD on the thing, in case I had to wake up. And I said, this time, if, it, if I die, I die. Mm -hmm. My body drops, I die. But I will not pick up the food. Yes. And I sort of said that, you know. So I was going to, so if the ego can kill me, Oh. then let it kill me, but I will not pick up. And it was that ferocious of me. I mean, he hadn't been trying to kill me with bananas in a short time okay. before. So, you know, so I knew it might, it might kill me. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. It might yeah. kill me. I might not make it, but so, so be it. So I got up again, so, you know, with another panic attack. I think it was choosing the worst thing it could scare me with, you know, the panic attack. So I got up and I sat in a chair very similar to this. I had a little, little thing and I sat and I was, it was like, I'm not leaving the chair. So either the panic attack kills me, or, you know, but my, you know, uh, Hawkins had said, you know, he, he, he faced the death of his ego, he became an enlightened teacher. So mm. he's a pretty good example. So, and so Francis says, you know, you have to face this, you have to face the death of what you think you are. The death mm. of what you think you are, you know, because mm. I, I had believed I'm the body and my thinking. Mm -hmm. So it felt like, well, if I feel this panic attack and don't medicate, then you know this thing can die. So that's like, I thought I could die because I thought I'm this. Yes. You know, I thought I was this. But anyway, so so be it. So I sat in the chair. I had faith in my teacher, and I'd had some spiritual experiences, and uh, I sat through it, and um, and it was like relentless. It was horrific. Like I couldn't mm -hmm. breathe, and um, it was suffocating, and it was like. You know, you've got to pick up, and it's like, 
you know the feelings like it'll it'll go on for all eternity and kill you, mm -hmm. like it will never ever end, mm -hmm. and it's so horrific, yeah. and you won't make it, and you should just pick up now, mm -hmm. you know, and turn back. And uh, all I will say was it was fifteen about fifteen to twenty minutes, and that's a long time. It was my first time ever, you know, like every second was like an eternity, yeah. of just like like being in hell and dying and not being able to breathe and suffocating. So it's like, you know, like facing death for 15 minutes and not knowing. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. But then after about 15 to 20 minutes, suddenly something happened. Mm -hmm. And this was the turning point. This was actually the worst feeling I've ever... I've been through some bad stuff. But this was the worst, this was a critical point, this panic attack. So it was like facing death. And then suddenly I could start to... There was some, it felt like there was air coming into the room. Mm -hmm. I could start to breathe and it was tailoring off. And then I could start to breathe deeply, and then it finished. And I had gone through my first panic attack without using anything. Mm -hmm. And I had a three or four mini, mini panic attacks after that. Uh, but then after you've been through your very first, I felt like it was like facing my own death. After you've been through the worst your ego can throw at you once, mm -hmm. this is what I want to share with everyone. Once you've gone through once, it's like, I think, you know, there's never been anything more horrible ever in my life. Because you, I faced my death. Mm. You know, you faced like I was willing to die, and I, I went through it. And I didn't die, and I think the ego ne didn't have anything more p stronger than that to scare me to mm. pick up. It's like this is the worst I can do to you. This is the worst feeling, mm. and the worst feeling of death. And I didn't pick up. And then there's three more panic attacks, which are easy. Oh, this is 15, 20 minutes. I can handle that. Yes. And then essentially, I haven't had a panic attack for about 10 years. Because mm. it stops doing it. Once you master it, it goes, oh, well, what's the point of doing that to making me? You know, it doesn't say 10 years of essence. So I just wanted to... Now, the other thing is, when I was getting... Uh, I just wanted to share this for people with food problems. But this is... It doesn't matter whether it's food or Netflix or Facebook or, or drugs or alcohol. Is that I knew it's repressed feelings, mm. you know. So, in, like, in the early days when I was having my meals, it wasn't like, you know, like... Um, I'd feel sad at the end of the meeting, like I want to cry, yeah. and, and I'd feel like, or I'd feel like looking forward to the food. But what I did was this, I would sit with my feelings before I'd eat, because I just need to know that I have to feel out all these repressed feelings, and then eventually it'll be a nothing. Because when you feel out all the, the repressed feelings mean that it, the ego's got a kind of a, can develop a craving, which is an illusion, that you need the food. You know, it's got, you've got, so the craving, or it, this could be like, you know, uh, for any other addiction, that you need the food. So if you felt out all your repressed feelings, like you wouldn't need food. Like every, I have to say this, because every enlightened teacher, you go listen to them, they say they need or want nothing. All enlightened teachers, I've, I've listened to quite a lot of them, they say if you offer them something, like if you offer them a, like a, a chocolate cake, and you say, do you need this, do you want this, they say no, they don't need it or want it because they're, they're at peace. Mm. They're already at a place beyond need and want. When you're connected <clears throat> in the whole, you know, the uh, Course in Miracles would call it the holy instant, or the, we call it the eternal now, or enlightenment. When you're in that place, you're in a place of infinite wholeness and oneness and love. Mm. So there is no, look, someone offers you a, cu a cake. Do you need it? You don't need it. Mm -hmm. You're like, when you're in the ultimate, will a chocolate cake do something? Will it give you a boost or something? It might give you a boost. So they have no, it has no appeal. Mm -hmm. So what creates the illusion of the, bo the boost is that the repressed feelings tie you to a low level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to shatter, uh, I want to sort of share for people in addiction the thing that really helped me. One of my teachers is um, Muji, another one. Uh, his teacher was Ramana Mah Maharishi, and he, he said this thing. When you want something, when you want something, it's like you have a thought that you want it. Like if I want a if I want a donut, I'll have a thought in the background. I want a donut. I can't wait to get out of this place. To, I hope the donut shops open later yeah. on and sees. That's like secretly going on in the background. You see. So, yeah. so, and because I really want it, it's been imbued with so much specialness and so much magic and so much like allure. And every time I eat a donut, I feel so wonderful. <laughs> so, so it's like. So really, when I eat the donut, because I've, my, my, I've been thinking about it, when I eat the donut, I have a high. Mm. 
-hmm. I have like an ecstasy rush. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I've been dreaming about this donut the whole day. And now I'm mm, yum. I'm eating. Yeah. <laughs> I'm but eating the donut. I'm eating the donut. Sorry, it's a bit. But some enlightened masters, though, they are a bit overweight, so they are must, they must <laughs> be indulging. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with some beer over here, right? Thank you. I thought about that. <laughs> yeah, they do. Okay. So if it's not, I'm sorry. Okay. I think. I think. You think I'm allowed to? It's true. That, that's an advanced question. Mm. I'll, I'll come to that <laughs> later. Okay. So, yes, some enlightened teachers were, were, were smoking cigarettes. <laughs> some enlightened teachers smoke cigarettes. Some of them, uh, like... Uh, it's like been something, because if, if you're overweight, you, do it, you don't gain weight. Well, you Just know... breathing. <laughs> Drinking water. <laughs> Drinking water. I, I think, you know, that the, there's, there's, a, there's a remnant of the ego, and there's also the thing of what's the internal... In the, what's the state of the enlightened teacher. So if, an enlightened teacher is someone who doesn't experience limitation. Mm. Mm. So they're not in a state of contracted limitation. They're not identified with their bodies or their thoughts. Mm -hmm. They're in the infinite state. So, mm. however, um, through grace and you could say what remains of the programming mm -hmm. of, uh, of what was left of the ego, not the ego is not the right word, Hawkins calls it the purusha, because the ego is dead. Now they're in a state of oneness, of yeah? one. purusha. So it's like a husk or a remnant of what mm -hmm. is interfacing, the instrument of what's left. Mm -hmm. However, the, the, the beingness is in limita in infinite, in the infinite. So when you're not identified with your body, you're no longer contracted to the, to the area of the body. When you're, not con when you're not identified with your thoughts, you're not the thinking mind or the place here. So you're, you're everything. So And once you're in the infinite, uh, you're not... The infinite is not having a dualistic experiencing of, of externals. But there can be, if they're, if they're absolutely in the infinite, then there won't be a hit. Mm -hmm. But the, um, there won't be a hit from doing something. Because when me limited me in limited state of consciousness, do activity which gives me a high, mm -hmm. takes me higher than my current level of consciousness, then that's, 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 a, that's, that's limitation going to a higher level. To experience a higher level than your current state of consciousness, you have to go to a more limitless level. So if you're in a limitless level, then, you know, a limit, you know so it's not going to be a hit. Mm -hmm. yeah? But the, the interfacing thing, it's like what's left of the packaging, which mm -hmm. is not identified with, can have, um, can have actions and things which carry on. You know, like um, there's a few things. So, uh, and then, so this is a, this is advanced. Like you know, you could say, Jesus, why was he angry mm. with the people in the temple? Was that personal anger? Mm. Was that like his ego was offended by the people in the temple, or there was um, Nisargata Maharaj, a famous Indian non-duality enlightenment teacher, who would smoke cigarettes. He used, to smoke, he used to be a chain smoker before, and when he went into the enlightened state, he carried on chain smoking. Mm -hmm. And spiritual seekers are like, you know, how comes you're enlightened and teaching all this stuff, and yet you're like smoking away like a chimney, you know? Yes. And uh, also, you know, some, you know some, might, some teachers might be overweight. So... Um, but it could be also that Jesus was, was not really angry, he was kind of... Um, he was expressing anger because that's what it was being expected. Or that's how, you know, uh, the people around him would have responded to. Well, so I mean, we don't know exactly. No, we don't, we don't, we don't know. Uh, uh, unless you use muscle testing. Uh, but I would say, like, it, at the infinite level, it wouldn't be personal anger. It wouldn't be like, yeah, yeah. you see, like, yeah, yeah. like, yeah. oh, you know, you've you've offended me in your mm. question. I'm personally angry yes. at, because yeah. my ego doesn't like you saying that. Yes, mm. So yes. I'm now yeah. angry at There's no separation. Uh, that's yeah. so, so it's not going to be coming from yeah. this dualistic no. yes. uh, dualistic point of view. What, what you were saying the other day actually about uh, if, if monks would be in the forest and there was near a village and there was an earthquake, they would act. Yeah. They will. They would act. But then when Everything was over. They would just carry on with no attachment. 
Um, yes. And the thing is, I understand what you, you, you mean definitely, well not definitely because I would have to be in an enlightened state to actually know exactly what that is, but 